of his servants who labor in defense of his unborn children and grant them courage and perseverance in their efforts. Let us pray to the Lord. And he will bless his servants with the grace of the Holy Spirit, ordering their efforts in wisdom and making them pleasing in his sight. Let us pray to the Lord. assign the guardian angel to banish from their efforts every enemy and obstacle, whether visible or invisible. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that he will not remember the transgressions of his people, but will turn away all his righteous wrath, which he has stirred up against us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Remembering our most holy and immaculate, most blessed and glorious Lady, the Mother of God and ever-Virgin Mary, together with all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. befit you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. In the sixth tone, the Lord is God and has appeared to us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is God and has
that we might be made worthy to hear the Holy Gospel. Let us pray to the Lord our God. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Is come, stand aright. Let us listen to the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. been raised from the dead stood in their midst and said to them peace to you then he said to them recall those words I spoke to you when I was still with you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled then he opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures he said to them Thus it is written that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. In his name, penance for the remission of sins is to be preached to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to this. See, I send down upon you the promise of my Father. Remain here in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out near Bethany, and with hands upraised to bless them. As he blessed them, he left them, and was taken up to heaven. They fell down to do him reverence, then returned to Jerusalem filled with joy. There they were to be found in the temple constantly speaking the praises of God. Christ is, risen. Christ is risen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, first of all, I would like to thank, thank you for your kind invitation to take part in this year's National March for Life here on Parliament Hill, the center of our nation's capital and the heart of our democracy. It is a special honor for me to speak to you, even though I live in the United States, but as a fellow Canadian from the West Coast, that's where really Canada is. <laughs> but especially today as we also, it's been a bit forgotten, but the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord into Heaven, to sit at the right hand of God, 40 days following His glorious resurrection from the dead. For the past 40 days, our hearts have been bursting with joy. Our lips have been singing the joyous Easter anthem. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death by his death, and granting life to those in the tombs. And we heard it resound in the march today. And the, during those same 40 days, our frail human minds have been trying, not totally successfully, to comprehend the meaning of the Son of God's suffering, death, and physical resurrection, and promises for us that ensued from it. And today, as we just heard in the Gospel reading, 
Jesus leads his followers to Bethany, blesses them, and ascends out of their sight into heaven. A new era has begun in the life of the nascent Christian community of Jerusalem. And this new life speaks to us who are gathered here in the defense of life, because this life is eternally new and always relevant. When we read another account of Jesus' ascension to heaven, this one in the first chapter of the book of the Acts, we see the apostles asking Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom, of, uh, kingdom to Israel? Following Jesus' resurrection, it was natural for the apostles to ask this question because in the back of their minds, they knew that one of the main tasks of the Messiah was to gather the 12 tribes of Israel together. And of course, we know Jesus' entire public life was one devoted to preaching, healing, and gathering the nation throughout Israel and Judea. But at this time, Jesus did not give them a straight answer. It's not for you to know, he says. He puts them off. But he does tell them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He tells them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In effect, he's indirectly answered the apostles' question with a twist. He's telling them, yes, I, I will indeed gather the nations together. How? Through my church, through you, my instruments who will be empowered with the Holy Spirit. So we see, my dear brothers and sisters, the apostles and we, their heirs, on the day of the ascension of our Lord into heaven, have received our marching orders. We have been handed our job description. It is we after having been clothed with the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit who are being sent out. It is we who have been commissioned by the Master to gather the tribes, humanity together, beginning from our own homes and local communities to the ends of the earth. And as if to underline this commissioning, in the account of the Acts of the Apostles, as Jesus is ascending, we see two men dressed in white garments, angels, who have this message for the apostles. Men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. In other words, the angels are saying, what are you people doing standing around, gawking with your mouths open? Get to work. Preach, heal, encourage, teach. Give witness to Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. Because you are the means by which Christ will gather the nations. Those two angels were speaking to us just as much as if we were standing there with Christ on Bethany. We, dear brothers and sisters, are the means, the instruments by which Christ will gather the nations. What a great privilege it is for us to be able to participate in this great and noble task of Christ the Messiah. And our participation in this annual national march for life, our physical presence, our prayers, our united voices, our witness to the sanctity of human life from conception until natural death is one small way in which we today gather the nations under the banner of Christ. This work, this task in which we are Christ's instruments, of course, is not easy. But neither did Christ promise us it would be easy. We simply have to read deeper into the book of the Acts 
to convince ourselves of this when we read of the suffering, rejection, persecution, and ultimately the martyrdom suffered by many who call themselves Christians in a pagan world. And yet the church grew inexorably, joyfully, even then. The apostles and the Christians, aided and emboldened by the Holy Spirit, did the work that Christ asked of them. Their witness spoke to the hearts of every person they met. That was them. But can we say our contemporary situation is so very different? We too find ourselves living in a pagan world. We too find that our message of the good news of Jesus Christ, the message of love, hope, and justice for the unborn, the voiceless and the powerless, unfortunately, is lost in the halls and chambers of the magnificent buildings behind us. It does not penetrate the hearts of many who walk and work in these halls and other centers of government, business, education, places awash in influence, power, and money. In many quarters, our message is met with disdain, derision, a growing intolerance. And in the future, who knows what more? Was the late Cardinal Francis George of Chicago, an intellectual giant of the American church, who passed away only a few short weeks ago, was he so very wrong when he declared in a memorable conference to his priests some years ago, I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison. And his successor will die a martyr in the public square. His successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has done so often in human history. Time will tell if the Cardinal's prophecy is destined to come to pass. But no matter, the insidious growth of neo-paganism and relativism of our modern societies does not mean we throw up our hands and give up. Like the apostles and the first Christians, we go out bravely into the public square. We march, we pray, we heal, we encourage, we teach, we give witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. We gather the nations, heart by heart, soul by soul. And we always remember that we have Christ at our head and in our midst. On the day of his ascension, Jesus was raised up to heaven to sit at the right hand of his Father. What does this mean? It means he rules and reigns over his church, over us, over the world, until the day of his second coming. We should never lose sight of this fact that he is ever governing, ever directing, ever guiding the work of his church his work in which we play such a vital role. We should never feel that we are our own. But we should always have confidence in the Lord who assured his followers as he was ascending to heaven, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age.
Sacrifice, je t'en aurai offert, mais tu ne prends point plaisir aux holocaustes. Le sacrifice agréable à Dieu, c'est un esprit brisé. D'un cœur contrit et humilié, Dieu n'a point de mépris. Seigneur, dans ta bienveillance, accorde à Sion le bonheur et rebâtis Jérusalem en ses murailles. Alors tu te plairas au juste sacrifice, holocauste et parfaite oblation. Alors on offrira des victimes sur ton hauteur. Have mercy on us, O God, in the greatness of your compassion. We pray you hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. We also pray for our most holy universal pontiff, Francis, Pope of Rome. For our most blessed patriarch, Sviatoslav, our most reverend metropolitan Lawrence, the most reverend Archbishop Terence, 
our God-loving Bishop Stephen, the God-loving Bishops John, Paul, and Christian, for those who serve or who have served in this place, for our spiritual fathers, and for all our brethren in Christ. under God for our government and for all the military. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. We also pray for all those who labor in defense of the sanctity of human life at every stage, from conception until natural death, that the Lord may bless their efforts, increase their numbers, and make their voice heard and understood unto the conversion of many in this land and throughout the world. We ask you, O Lord, graciously hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. We also pray for mercy, life, peace health, salvation, and divine visitation for the servants of God who strive against the evils of abortion, that the Lord God will protect them in all that they do, and for the pardon and remission of their sins. We ask you, O Lord, graciously hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. unborn children of God in danger of death by the unjust judgment of men and women, that the Lord would soften the hearts of those who seek their violent destruction, and rescue those who are being led forth to the slaughter. We ask you, O Lord, graciously hear us and have mercy. mothers and fathers, and those who advise them in the decision to take the lives of their unborn children, and who now repent, that the Lord God might have mercy on them, and that they might be able to accept his forgiveness and peace. We ask you, O Lord, graciously hear us and have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So pray for the people here present to await your great and abundant mercy for those who have been kind to us and for all Orthodox Christians. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have Son and Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Bowing our heads, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. O most merciful, all gracious, and compassionate Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Son of God. We entreat you to look with compassion upon your children who are in danger of death by the unjust judgment of men and women. Turn the hearts of those who seek to destroy your little ones. We beseech you, pour forth your healing grace upon them, that they may turn from such a decision. Convert them, O Lord, to the true faith and piety, that believing they may turn from evil and do good. O Divine Healer, we ask you to touch the hearts of mothers and fathers who are preparing to violently end the lives of their pre-born children. 
Give them the strength and faith to have a change of heart and to spare their children from death. As for us, give us, O Lord, hearts of love and repentance, so we, your people, may cherish these parents and their children. May they find your compassion and love in our churches and our homes. O gentle Jesus, as you have promised to bestow the heavenly kingdom on those born of water and the Spirit, and to those who in blamelessness of life have been translated unto you, and who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. We humbly pray according to your unfailing promise, grant the inheritance of your kingdom to the multitude of the spotless infants who have been cruelly slain in the mortuaries of this land, for you are the resurrection, life, and repose of your servants and of these innocents, O Christ our God. Hear the sincere prayer of your servants gathered here, and give success to this holy endeavor regarding human life. Help them and bless them and grant them courage and perseverance, and lead along the path of righteousness all who truly love your name and strive to observe your precepts. For you are a merciful God and you love mankind, and unto you we give glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Before the dismissal, just a very brief word of thanks again to our beloved archbishops and bishops. Thank you so much for leading us in prayer and reflection today. And a very special thanks to the person who actually organizes all of this, and that's Father Teodosi Krajchuk. Now, we don't usually applaud in our tradition, but uh, since so many of you are used to applauding, let it go. Please uh, thank Father Teodosi for all of his work. And a special thank you also to Presbytera Irene Galazza, who is here representing our wonderful husband, who taught us to sing all this, and for the first time in years is not here with us. So, Irka, duže djakuju.